Some years ago, Jonathan Bowden elucidated the idea of a return to the cultured thug. What he meant by this was the return to a type of right-wing, anti-modern individual who bridged the gap between the intellectually strong but physically weak scholar and the physically strong but intellectually weak fighter. The idea of such an individual was given a kind of brief poetic life by Bowden when he mentioned Lord Byron, who was of course both a driving force behind the romantic movement in literature as well as an imposing pugilist who fought and died in the Greek uprising against the Ottoman Turks. I believe, however, that we have a more modern example in the form of a curious Japanese writer from the last century, a man of contradictions who in his own words wanted to live his life as a poem written with a splash of blood, a man who, robbed of a death in war, orchestrated his own, a man entirely in touch with the aesthetic and artistic philosophies, and also one who tirelessly built up his own body and martial prowess into something warrior-like, a last manifestation of the credo of the samurai. Yukio Mishima, the last aristocrat of the Orient. Born to the name Kimitake Hiraoka in 1925, Mishima would take on the name we know him by now at 16, and never give it up again. His upbringing was not unusual for a boy of the interwar Japanese upper class. Though his father was a government salaryman, Mishima was a direct descendant of the first Tokugawa shogun, Tokugawa Iyasu, through his grandmother, and the family maintained aristocratic pretensions. Mostly raised by his grandmother, he attended the elite peers' school, where he was noted to have a somewhat effete and weak constitution, but a keen talent for literature. He read classic Greek and Japanese mythology, as well as a wide range of Western literature, which included Oscar Wilde, Jean Cocteau, Rilke, Nietzsche, Baudelaire, and his lifelong favourite novelist, Thomas Mann. Mishima's main activity at this time was writing poetry and short stories, which were noticed by adult literary societies, and Mishima was proclaimed a prodigy. Though his work was published early on, wartime paper shortages prevented a wider appreciation. While at school, Mishima was encouraged by traditionalist mentors, and his diaries from the time reveal a keen appreciation for the Shinto faith and a devotion to the emperor, still considered a god by wider Japanese society. However, Mishima also began to discover his own homosexuality, which was clear enough in the all-boys school he attended. This troubled him, since he did not really at that age understand why he was so different from the others, so he began to construct what he called his mask, a kind of unbreakable face of normality he could present to the world. He joined in with schoolboy sex jokes and made attempts at flirting with women. Even then, he did not shy away from writing about this inner turmoil under a pseudonym. In 1944, Mishima graduated high school with top-of-the-class honours, and was personally gifted a silver watch by Emperor Hirohito. Naturally, what came next was immediate conscription into Japan's hard-pressed army. The war had not been going well for some time, and despite the propaganda, everyone knew it. Mishima was ready to give up his life for the Emperor and for Japan, but at his medical exam, a doctor misdiagnosed his cough as tuberculosis, and he was declared totally unfit for service. This was the foundational event of Mishima's life thereon. He desired to die, indeed he had planned to volunteer for a kamikaze unit, and yet death did not want him. Had he been a coward for not trying to correct the mistaken doctor, if he wanted death so much, why could he not seek it? In any case, it was soon too late. Japan surrendered in less than a year, and Mishima vowed from then on to protect Japanese culture and help rebuild it after the destruction of war. Mishima's father wanted him to be a bureaucrat, and Mishima indeed obtained a post at the Treasury Ministry, but this exhausted and bored him, and after only a year, he quit to become a full-time novelist. In 1946, his efforts resulted in the book Confessions of a Mask, a semi-autobiographical account of a young homosexual who hides behind a mask of normality. The novel was an extreme success in Japan and abroad, and made Mishima a wealthy celebrity at only 24. 
This was followed up with the successes of the Sound of the Waves and the Temple of the Golden Pavilion. However, Mishima attracted negative attention for his traditionalist mindset to aesthetics and culture, and the term fascist began to be thrown at him by the Japanese left, and it would remain with him until now. By 1960, social tensions in Japan were mounting over the proposed ANPO Treaty, which would allow US military bases and troops to be stationed permanently in the country. This drew enormous protests from both the left, who were unfavorable to the American side of the Cold War, and the right, who feared a total American takeover of Japan. Mishima followed the event closely, and made strong criticism of leftist factions, who he criticized as foolish and demagogic, subsisting on honeyed words. Around this time, Mishima also began to take up bodybuilding, as well as modeling and acting, to overcome the inferiority complex he felt about his weak body. He began to fixate on himself as an aesthetic object, appearing many times in artistic poses, in magazines and photographs. Mishima would go on to pen the famous essay, Sun and Steel, in which he elucidated his belief that a great artist cannot neglect the body of the physical arts, or else his value as an artist and his ability to communicate truth would suffer. Mishima also learned the art of kendo and became a black belt in karate as well as several other martial arts. In 1961, Mishima became embroiled in the Shimanaka incident. A notable author, Fukazawa, published a short, a very surreal short story, which includes a scene in which the emperor and empress are beheaded with a guillotine. The story's publication in national magazines led to a vicious uproar from the right, which included death threats to all involved. And only a few days after the story was put to print, a 17-year-old writer named Kazutaka Komori broke into the home of the publisher and attempted to kill him. The attempt was botched, and the youth only managed to kill a maid and mortally injure the publisher's wife. As a result, writers and literary figures were given a mandatory police guard for several months, and an even worse national uproar ensued. Mishima wrote articles criticizing the youth for attacking innocent women and children, but controversially also provided a template for honorable assassination. He said that assassination attempts should be strict one-on-one -on -one confrontations between two individuals, and that a good Japanese assassin commits honorable suicide after having carried out the action. It should be noted that this incident provided the catalyst for the parliamentary right to introduce a laissez-majeste law which criminalized certain depictions of the royal family, but generally put the monarchy beyond the reproach of artists. Mishima spent much of the 60s working on theater rather than novels, producing traditional Japanese kabuki plays, western-style dramas, and various blends of forms. Among these was the controversial play My Friend Hitler, which is an adaption of an old story about the friends of a powerful man destined to become the shogun, updated to Hitler's private circle of the mid-twenties. These plays met with success, though time and time again, Communist Party-affiliated actors would refuse to perform his plays, so he was forced to found several independent theatrical companies out of his own pocket. He also became increasingly nationalistic and reactionary around this time. He lived in genuine fear of a leftist revolution in Japan, and even criticized the emperor for having renounced his divinity at the end of the Second World War. Mishima lived his life by the strict Bushido code of the samurai, which earned him never-ending hatred and mockery from the Japanese left, especially since he maintained that the post-war period was one of false prosperity, in which money flourished but no great artists were born. In 1967, Mishima began the formation of a private army of right-wing students, which he hoped would go on to become a kind of indigenous national guard, Young men would enlist for basic training with the army, then leave and join Mishima's private unit. He insisted that all members draw their own blood and sign a blood oath that they would sooner die than see a leftist revolution come to Japan. The following year, it seemed as if such an event would happen. 1968 was the year of the new left, and students all over the world, Japan included, took over dozens of major university campuses. It was in 1970, not long after, that Mishima would commit the act he is perhaps most famous for. On the morning of November 25th, 1970, 
he and four members of his private army entered the barracks at central Tokyo on the pretext of a visit, whereupon they captured the colonel in charge of the base and tied him up as a hostage. With a prepared manifesto and a banner listing all their demands, Mishima stepped out onto the balcony to address the soldiers gathered below. His speech was intended to inspire a coup d'etat to restore the power of the emperor and do away with liberal parliamentary democracy. He succeeded, however, only in irritating the soldiers and was heckled with jeers and the noise of an above helicopter drowned out some parts of the speech. In the speech, Mishima rebuked the Japan self-defense force for their passive acceptance of a constitution that denies their own existence. And he shouted to rouse them, where has the spirit of the samurai gone? After he finished reading his prepared speech in a few minutes' time, Mishima cried out, Long live the emperor, Tenoheka Banzai, three times. He then retreated into the com commandant's office and apologized to the commandant, then committed seppuku in the traditional manner with a sword to the stomach, before, after several attempts, a second cut off his head. It is widely considered that Mishima's actions had no intention of overthrowing the government, but that it was merely a well-staged suicide. Mishima had come to feel that Japan was trapped in an impossible position, between the United States on one hand and China and the Communists on the other, and that when inevitably the war came, Japan would be doomed. Thus, his suicide was an expression that he had done all he felt he could, and only an honourable death remained in the path of action. It is said that just 10 years prior, had the same event occurred, considerable numbers of people in Japan would have committed ritual suicide in solidarity. Apart from his style, usually ornate and meticulously wrought, Mishima's success stemmed in part from his effectiveness at capturing the sense of void and despair that typified many Japanese during the post-war period. Another key to his success lay in his unusual interest in Japanese cultural tradition. His abilities, unique among his peers, enabled him to write in the genre of classical kabuki and no plays. Mishima's early works represent a period that both clarified the direction in which his talents would go, and developed features that would become trademarks of his later work. He came to realize that poetry was not to be his major effort, and in 1941, the year he graduated from the Peers School and met the Emperor, he published his first lengthy work, The Forest in Full Bloom, in October at age 16. The maturity of this style in such a juvenile work amazed his mentors and peers. The sophisticated choice of words and language is noteworthy, but the maturity goes much further. It establishes the major theme of his life's work, for he was well on the way to evolving the aesthetic formulas that would distinguish his work. Longing leads to beauty, beauty generates ecstasy, Ecstasy leads to death. Likewise, the sea, an important motif throughout his writing, is associated almost entirely with death. Indeed, as the translator Donald Keane notes, Mishima seems to be intoxicated with the beauty of early death. Preoccupation with death, almost a fascination perhaps, is obvious even in the title of the short story collection that constitutes his, constitutes his major short fiction available in English. Death in Midsummer and other stories. The title story itself, Death in Midsummer, takes an epigraph from one of Charles Baudelaire's poems that translates as, Death affects us more deeply under the stately reign of summer. The psychological realism of Mishima's presentation of the family's reactions to three deaths in the family is the focus of the story. What then do we as reactionaries learn from Mishima's life and work? He was an artist in the total sense, but a man who did not shy away from action either. His works such as Runaway Horses and Patriotism glorified young, humble men, often from rural and perhaps unhappy backgrounds, who through nothing but sheer devotion to the emperor and the Japanese way of life, and against all odds, took on a system that they saw as subversive and corrupting. Whether capitalism, communism, or in Mishima's own case, consumerism, the cultured thug, as Bowden called him, is perhaps the greatest expression of the right as an individual, a being that overcomes the now lost hierarchy of warrior or monk, a man capable of great feats of strength of both mind and body. Lost among modernity, 
we might not be the ones to overthrow this regime. What matters is that on the physical and metaphysical planes, we are honorable enough and ready to fight it.